Good afternoon. I am back and it looks like my camera is not responding there. Oh, it disconnected. Okay, give me one sec, guys. Why it did that? There we go. Good afternoon and welcome back. If you were in my stream this morning, um, I took a break. I had lunch. I had a tasty rice and bean cold salad that I made. The recipe came out really well. It was really good. And I uh, had a turkey wrap and a Caribbean popsicle, which is suitable because we are painting a Caribbean voodoo themed dragon with a tropical drink um, inspired by a zombie drink. So I thought if it's a zombie, which is my boyfriend's favorite tropical drink, that um that it could be a voodoo dragon and that was sort of my train of thought so i inked this yesterday we started painting this this morning and we're gonna uh continue painting it and unlike this morning i have much better lighting because i was able to open the windows because it's not as sunny out it's just sort of it looks sunny i guess behind me but it's um bizarrely overcast but somehow still bright out so that's a little that's a little weird <laughs> okay so I got to work on getting the rest of our dragon's body painted. Get started on on that. Then we'll finish up all the details. And I'm realizing I actually missed a little bit of my blue background. I missed these areas in here, which I had intended to at least have a little blue on. Of course, now I'm going to finish painting the dragon's tail because I let that blue dry, but I can work on the rest of his body. <sighs> I figured I'd stream for another hour or two now. I guess we'll just see how it goes. I know the cats kind of need some attention, and I have to put sheets back on the bed because I washed all of our bedding today, all of our blankets, all of our sheets, uh, in an effort to... <laughs> better combat the uh, terrible allergies we've been having. I don't know how much it's going to help, but clean sheets always are nice. <laughs> so and It's not helping the whole allergies and weirdness by the strange weather we're having. Very strange weather that we're having. <laughs> so we'll see what it does. It doesn't know if it wants to be sunny or overcast. My boyfriend said it sprinkled a little bit on his car driving home for lunch, which is weird. <laughs> I've got my iced tea here to help me stay awake. That I just remember to make ahead of time <laughs> in a big pitcher. So I'm having a Celestial Seasonings Peach Cold Brew Tea today. I'm very excited right before I started streaming again. Amazon Prime delivered. He delivered shampoo and conditioner, which is good because we were probably only got enough left for another week. And they delivered um, a new box of pens, which, oh, they're right here. A new box of the pens I use. I buy these. They're between 12 and 15. <coughs> Excuse me. See, allergies, fun. Okay, uh, these are the pens I use. They're between twelve and fifteen dollars for a box of twelve, so it's a pretty good deal um, to buy them this way because I go through a lot of them. And this is what I use to do all of the ink drawings that you guys see me painting. So those came, but even more importantly, my tea came. I'm so excited. So I have a favorite tea that is they do stock it in stores, but it is really overpriced. It is like. For your standard box, which is maybe 20, 25 tea bags, it might be as many as 30, but I think it's 25. Uh, it's anywhere from six to eight dollars in the health food stores here, which is ridiculous. Um, and it's the same price online unless you're buying a lot of it. So I found for like $22, I could get six boxes. <laughs> so I will not run out of my tea anytime soon. And it is my favorite tea over time. I love the um, Ahmed vanilla tea, which I also buy in, in batches of six boxes or sometimes 12 boxes but my favorite tea is by a company called yogi and they uh always put fortunes on the tea bag tags which is really fun like weird things 
um, either fortunes or like sayings. Or once we got one that said, help, I'm stuck in a tea factory, which is the best one. Uh, but they also make a variety of flavors. Some of their like more holistic ones I don't like as much. But my favorite one is the Egyptian licorice tea, which tastes nothing like licorice. I know that sounds gross and weird. I do actually like licorice, but it really doesn't taste anything like licorice. It's just a really nice tea. And it, it over time, over the last 20 years or so, has become kind of my favorite but it's a little harder to get. It's not like a $3 box, it's like a $6 box unless you buy a lot. So I splurged about three weeks ago and ordered, so I haven't had it for a while, ordered my six boxes and they just showed up. Of course, right after I poured myself a glass of iced tea, but it's a little warm right now. Maybe tomorrow morning I will, or, or this evening I will make myself some. Okay, so this is our voodoo dragon. He is um, not so much New Orleans voodoo, though that's a little bit tied to it, uh, as he is inspired by... Caribbean voodoo, which is why there's tiki's and stuff. And he is guarding a tiki drink, which I am basing on. It's probably going to be um, the colors of like a drink, which is kind of a pinkish red. Because I was thinking of my boyfriend's favorite drink when I was making this. At least that's one of his favorites. Uh, he goes through different phases, but when we met, this was what he always used to order all the time were zombies. And they did not always come in cool glasses like this. They usually just came in like a regular sort of pint glass or, or just a kind of like one of these. Uh, but I felt if I was doing a book that had creatures inspired by drinks, I should include it. And I apologize for the sniffling. I'm not sick, I promise. It's just allergies. The doctor has confirmed this because Daniel got them way worse than me. So he's... He's super medicated. He had to kind of not take them this morning because half of the medicines they prescribed for him yesterday said, do not operate machinery or drive vehicles with them. And he they didn't give him time off from work. They said it wasn't severe enough. So he's uh, he's on the, the safer meds right now. And then we'll be back on those when he has the weekend off. I usually take allergy meds, but when I do, they make me really sleepy. So I like to do... My painting and stuff first, and then later this afternoon I'll take some, but I have a whole list of random household chores I've got to do too. But I wanted to paint this guy. And I felt like the inside of his wings weren't standing out enough, so I'm incorporating some of the the reddish color from his his fine tufts, I guess, feathers, whatever. <laughs> whatever we're going to call them. Fluffs. His fluffy tufts. I don't know. These are definitely more feather inspired than they are scale inspired. Almost done with his base colors and then I get to do all the details. Both adding shadows and then we're going to add some highlights and white ink, which if you've watched me before, you've seen me do lots of times. Yeah, I could tell we're having like a really weird weather thing because like my ears hurt and it's not just from the allergies, it's the pressure system that's going through. It's really weird. I don't know what's going on with it. <laughs> I don't particularly like it because uh, I'm very sensitive to weather pressure. So yes, it is um, sort of a tropical voodoo dragon. I know we have several other tropical drinks in the book, but this one is probably going to be having a zombie because us voodoo that totally makes sense <laughs> in my head it makes sense there was a there was a connected train of thought when i drew this yesterday um this morning we painted a mojito wyvern i actually have an entire stack because when i wasn't filling up to streaming yesterday um even though i was having terrible allergies i handed up take it easy and i lay down for like five minutes i was like nope i'm gonna draw so <laughs> Even though I was feeling well yesterday, I did a ton of drawings. I did five drawings and even inked them. So they are all set for us to color. So this is number two. So I guess that kind of put me a little ahead on the art department because I couldn't do... This morning I did a little bit of writing and stuff before I streamed, but it, it kind of... <laughs> usually I try to balance it more than that and ended up getting kind of ahead on the art side of things because that was what I was up to doing. So I still have to do his whole tiki voodoo staff here too 
not to mention some shading, but his basic colors are there. I'm just showing up better now than they did in my earlier stream because the lighting was a little weird. It was super sunny out, so I had the curtains pulled, but then, I don't know, something with the indoor lighting, it doesn't work as well, even when I'm using my, my drawing light, so... I'm trying to make sure I stream either morning or afternoon right now because today and tomorrow I think all the DJs are going nuts. <laughs> as long as the only way to how to describe it, the DJs are going nuts this weekend. There's so much stuff. I could listen to like five hours of music, six hours of music tomorrow night back to back if I wanted to. There's so much stuff going on. And those are all of our, our local Tucson, Arizona DJs. They're all doing a ton this weekend. One of my good good friends... Uh, and favorite DJs finally gave in and started streaming uh, another victim for us to harass on Twitch. So he's added himself to the mix. So I'm very excited about that. He did a Revenge of the Fifth Star Wars 80s pop party the other night. And I think he might be doing Mutiny this weekend, which is another one of our local nights here where we just do like weird music videos with alternative stuff. And it's just another fun Fun thing we do here in Tucson, so. Uh, and another one that I miss just Fine Line, uh, which is sort of alternative 80s goth uh, music night that we have here, I guess is the best way to describe it. And they started the streaming that the last week, too. So now we have, I think tomorrow night, we have like three different events going on back to back. It's nice of them to coordinate, so they're not overlapping too much. And then um, we have another event tonight, too, so. I'll see which of them I'm up to, depending on how many allergy meds I have to take. But since I don't have to get up at 5.30 tomorrow morning, I might actually get to attend stuff. It sucks, though, because when you're on allergy meds and you are all stuffy, you don't necessarily feel up to dancing, which, which is no fun. Because, of course, there are such good DJs. I want to dance. Okay, he's coming along, I think. I feel like uh, because he have, I put this kind of gold glow in, that some of that should be on his mask, too. Hello! I was just talking about all the awesome local streamers, and there's another one. <laughs> Those Arizona folks are all streaming like crazy. I keep seeing people having all these activities that they like, memes of activities that people are bored and... Here's what they did. They spent 16 to 25 hours building their cat a tank out of cardboard boxes. And hundreds of people have done this. And I'm like, what the heck is that much free time? I mean, I know you were at home, but doesn't everyone have stuff they got to get done at home? Home repairs, chores, um, projects to work on. I'm just like, who the heck has this much free time to complain that they're bored? I hate them so much right now. <laughs> I was like, what the heck? Yeah, I thought his uh, his skulls looked a little disjointed because I kind of wanted this to look almost like firelight and then it would be a little yellower. So and I'm going to have to put a lot of highlights, especially on the eye. But he's getting there. Okay, so this being a zombie drink, it's going to be a sort of pinkish red color. We really miss the zombies from the Surly Wench. One of Daniel's favorite drinks. I am partial to... The Elvis Lives, which is coconut and lime. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, at first people didn't know when I started painting it this morning. They were like, they thought he was a skull dragon. I'm like, no, no, he's wearing one. As soon as I put the color in, you'll, you'll realize that. So he's probably actually a cute little green dragon, but he's like all into the voodoo. <laughs> so <laughs> he's wearing like a skull and he's got like a voodoo stuff. And when I was all high on allergy meds yesterday, that was where my brain went. It was like, hmm, okay, if I'm doing a voodoo tropical tiki drink or a, a zombie top of tropical tiki, tiki drink, what sort of dragon would it be? And then when I was looking at tiki cups, I started seeing like all the Caribbean like voodoo stuff. And I was like, ooh, I could do something with that. I've never done a voodoo dragon. So, oh, thank you. I don't think I've been bored in a really long time. I have to be, like, sick and unable to do stuff. Um, so I have to, like, lie there, but too, maybe too sick or whatever to sleep. Then I could get bored. That's kind of the only case where I'm going to get bored. Um, there's just too much stuff I want to do or need to do. I just don't. 
I do find some tasks for work, like I can get find mailing stuff really boring after the first 20 packages, so I just make sure that I only do a certain number per day. After this, I'm going to mail stuff, and I am going to remember that there's sheets in the dryer that are clean that have to go back on the bed so that we will not go to bed tonight and just be like, there's no sheets on the bed, because that's happened before from both of us, so. Banjo Kazuli? What is what okay, what is Kazuli? I get I know what Kazoo is. I don't know if I know what Kazuli. <laughs> just like a specific uh, band. That's probably it. Oh the game. Okay. I am vaguely familiar with the game. Actually the things that most remind me of Caribbean voodoo. Are, um, there's an Agatha Christie mystery that they've done a couple of of uh, versions of on film that it might just be called the Caribbean mystery. I know there's one that's like the Caribbean one and there's another one, but she's um, staying at a resort in the Caribbean for her um, her rheumatism and ends up solving a murder. And then uh, the entire Death in Paradise series <laughs> Because that's all murder in paradise and, and beautiful tropical locations. Yes, I watch a lot of murder mysteries. Uh, and then I also am a little bit reminded of Monkey Island because there's a little bit of a tiki vibe to the cannibals in the Monkey Island video game series, which is still one of my favorite video game series of all time. Oh, well, I'm glad I probably didn't make the dragon pink. I don't want to be too similar to something already out there. Got a lot of similar colors here, but I gotta do the little bit there. And I have to do some cleanup with white ink. I have a little red that bled because I hadn't let the face dry completely, but that's easy enough to fix. Okay, and then I need to do this, which is an orange. Yeah, I was showing them on my earlier stream, but I can show them again. I'm going to have to let this dry for a minute anyway, so I can show you guys the uh, the assorted craziness that happened yesterday. So apparently when I just draw dragons, because I've done so many, I'm really fast. So it's just like watching TV on allergy meds, and the other camera was like, how many pictures have you done? And I was like, oh my gosh, I did like five ink drinks. So this is the uh, dragon we painted this morning. He is a mojito wyvern. He's wrapped around a mojito with mint and lime then still to be painted as voted on by patreon subscribers the sipper serpent he uh, likes to he's a worm dragon that likes to taste everyone's drinks behind their backs and then uh we knew this one was coming i'm gonna talk about this one for a bit the sophisticated cocktail drake so he's gonna have a cosmopolitan in the picture he's a very uh sophisticated elegant dragon and then the big one so you know how some dragons they hoard treasure this guy is hoarding tea bags <laughs> because i am very weird um and because of the theme of the book so <laughs> he should be purple which one should be purple this guy or the one which one of the dragons <laughs> Because I did the mojito dragon in purple because I was trying to contrast the the minty colors. The zipper dragon? Is he purple? I don't know. I think he might be uh, he might be red in my version. I haven't done a lot of red dragons for the book, so I think he might be red. Though I could do the the tea bag hoarder is red. I feel like that's a little a little cliche. Do you like the big red lurky dragon on top of the pile of treasure? <laughs> But yeah, the reason I wasn't streaming that much over the last like week or so is we just really weren't feeling well. We've just had, I've been been trying to get back to it uh, at least every other day, but I'm now I'm trying to do it every day if I can. But at least every other day. But yeah, everyone kept trying to be like a little bossy on Facebook and diagnose what was wrong with us, and I was like, we have allergies. Dale's just having really bad allergies, and then um, he stayed home from work yesterday because he was in so much pain. So him to the doctor and lo and behold we have allergies <laughs> uh, and they said that basically he's just got because he had sinus infections and we had all these other colds he's just 
really, really bad ones. So they gave him an allergy shot and like a ton of different meds that he is on now. Well, not right now. He can't be on some of them at work because they said no heavy machinery. But yeah, I think he might be red. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I haven't decided on that one. I'm trying to shade in the teeth of the tiki mug. I'm actually pretty uh, familiar with tiki designs because my ex-boyfriend from L.A. from like, oh gosh, we're kind of like 15 years ago, but that was the only other really serious relationship I had that lasted years where I actually lived with someone. Um, he was obsessed with tikis. He collected them and I actually sculpted a tiki for him once. So I, a tiki mug. So I learned a lot about tikis. But I still love them. It hasn't ruined my love for them, even if he turned out to be a jerk. So, uh, the other reason I was never going to live with anyone again. And then Daniel came along and honestly, he was here all the time anyway. So then he just, eventually I was like, dude, just bring your stuff over. This is getting dumb. <laughs> and then that's about the time you should move in with someone when they're just pretty much there all the time anyway. Um, otherwise I think it's rushing things. But I think if, if you, uh, if you're spending time together anyway, then it works out okay. Especially if you can totally respect each other's boundaries. Like, we do a lot of separate stuff, though. We've been playing a lot of Stardew Valley, and I wanted to stream some of it, but I wanted to get my headset so that we could use Push to Talk. So if we were either both streaming or both on there, we could um, kind of both have a way to talk. Because he has a Push to Talk headset, and we found one for me finally that wasn't super expensive. And I don't know what happened. It got, like, super delayed. It's supposed to be her Monday, so we'll see if that eventually happens. Because right now I'm using the um, the microphone in my camera, and it's the, the camera I'm using for the art. Because it's pretty near my face. It's actually, like, right here. It's just out of the, the vision of the other camera um, so that it can be over my paper so you guys can see what I'm doing. So that means I'm close to the microphone in it, but... If I'm streaming a game or digital painting, I have to wear a headset. And the one I have is just, it's more like a DJ headset. It's very, very clunky. And this may not be apparent from streaming, but I have a tiny head. Like I put on Daniel's hats and they stop because they hit my nose. <laughs> so uh, for whatever reason, I have a tiny head, tiny jaw, I have like a child size head. So headsets, even on the size adjustable ones, they tend to be very heavy for me. But we found a nice lightweight one that I really, really like. I'll still use this one for music and stuff. It's just, it's not great if I'm going to be streaming art on the computer uh, because I still kind of bend over my tablet a little bit. So it just ends up being, ends up being awkward. Uh, I've done that. I just end up with headaches. <laughs> so I'd rather, rather not do that. You know, just working on all the details of this guy. I kind of feel like he's like a little raptory kind of dragon for some reason, like a little, little baby velociraptor looking dragon. That's cool. We had five or six people in here this morning. We got three or four people in here now. I guess Fridays are a better day to stream. Then I was saying you shouldn't stream when everyone else is streaming. And then I'm like, yeah, but that's when people raid you and you get a bunch of people in your stream. So sometimes that's good. So I don't know. I just usually am so tired with us getting up at like 5.30 in the morning now that by the evening it's kind of late for me to stream. And if we do DJ stuff, I usually end up taking a nap. I think that's going to happen. But for anyone who tuned in this morning, I am very, very proud of my cooking experiments. My basmati rice and bean chilled salad worked out awesome. Those are nice. And I have different headsets that I use for like my cell phone. If I'm taking a walk and I want to listen to use it like a Walkman and listen to music or if I'm listening to music at the computer. But because um, because I have such a small head, I actually need like a really, really lightweight, smaller headset and the push to talk. Oh, my God. It was so good. If you look it up online, uh, hang on a second. I'll tell you what you'll look up the recipe under. It was so easy to make. It is under it's by uh, Taste of Home. If you know them, they have awesome recipes. And uh, it's called Cool Beans Salad. And it is uh, basically like you mix red wine vinegar and olive oil and a bunch of seasoning. And then it's, if you have a rice cooker, it's super easy. You have uh, basmati rice and then you have several kinds of beans. You have like fresh cut up like red pepper and little green onions. So it has some crunch. Oh my God, it was 
really good. And I use the exact proportions for seasoning that they said. It actually has like um, a tiny bit of chili powder, cumin, garlic, stuff like that. If it's not super strong and it's good by itself or it's good um, as kind of a side dish. We had turkey wraps with ours um, and it made a lot. <laughs> it probably made too much. But yeah, I was thinking because it's so hot right now here in Arizona, I was like, I want something that I can do since with the rice cooker, I don't actually have to like use the stove, stand over the rice or anything, something, stuff like that I can make that doesn't have a lot of ingredients that are hot, especially for lunches because Daniel comes home from having been out in like hundred degree weather and really doesn't feel like hot food. So, um, he's on so many drugs right now. His tummy has not been very happy giving him, I'm going to make him a smoothie later, give him lots of yogurt because he has on the third set of antibiotics in the last six weeks so super fun but he is feeling better so and I basically have the same symptoms I just have them like a lot less like my ears hurt but they're not like sharp pains it's just uh it's just allergies evil evil allergies it's because it's really windy and there's if you live in Arizona and have been outside recently you've probably seen the half inch to inch high piles of pollen against every curb we went we went to Safeway to get something yesterday and I was like no wonder we don't feel well look at the pollen so then today is acting like it's gonna rain so the pressure system's all weird and it's making my ears feel like I'm in an airplane super fun I always wonder if this is a correlation between people who are sensitive to pressure changes and people who get motion sick because I get really motion sick which is obviously inner ear related but then I also I always know when we're going to get rain or at least get a pressure system moving through because I can feel it. Nothing magical. It's just my ears will really hurt. <laughs> my head will feel weird. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, it's one of those days. <laughs> okay. But yeah, highly recommend cool bean salad, which is kind of like maybe a play on the saying cool beans, which is an expression. I'm not sure. It might be a play on that. Um, but yeah, I always... Pleasantly surprised. Sometimes the recipes I try, I'm like, oh, this is this is not bad, but it's got too much seasoning or something for me. But but Daniel kept making fun of me because I am not originally from the Southwest. And uh, being from the East Coast and having parents from the Midwest and from New York City, I grew up pronouncing certain <laughs> words differently. Oh, Yeah. You can get like knee aches when it's going to rain too. And you can usually smell it. Um, here you just have to look and see if the humidity is spiking too. Because we never have that much humidity. So the minute it starts spiking, you know rain is coming. Yeah, he's making fun of me for saying the names of certain ingredients for that salad with, I guess, what's an East Coast white girl accent versus a proper Mexican pronunciation. And I'm like... I didn't grow up in a place that had Mexican culture. I mean, yeah, we had Mexican restaurants, but, you know, we didn't, like, that's not common in upstate New York in farm country. That's just not, you know, he already makes fun of me for not speaking Spanish. So now he makes fun of me because I say cilantro instead of saying it with, like, the Mexican burr and the cilantro, but, like, with, like, he says it with, like, the, I can't do the rolling Mexican R correctly, apparently. So for the Spanish... I don't know if it's a Spanish word. That's just the name of the plant, but there's a way of saying it with the Spanish accent that I that I don't do. So he was just like, say it again. And I'm like, stop doing that. Don't make fun of me. You say things in a different accent than I grew up with. It sounds funny to me when you say it. I don't make fun of you. <laughs> but it was, uh, I guess I entertained him. So it's not a terrible thing, right? Uh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't grow up in a Spanish-speaking community, so a lot of folks here are bilingual and they speak both. And most of the kids I grew up with were learning French because we weren't that far from Canada, and a lot of people were bilingual with English and French. And then, so I knew a little bit of French, but I was the one interested in ancient Mayan, Aztec, and Egyptian, which are not super useful now. Uh, can't tell from my work there's definitely always some ancient civilization influence but I was never that linguistically talented I think it skipped me because my brothers both were my mom was 
one of my great grandparents spoke like 14 languages or something ridiculous like that. So I guess I'm more visual and I, I really love writing. So I don't know if I just got that fascinated with the English language. I know a smattering of French. I know a smattering of Japanese. I know the only important phrase in Klingon. There's only one important phrase in Klingon. Uh, and I know that one. Uh, because my brother had the Klingon dictionary growing up, and that's the only one I retained was the most important one. Which is pretty funny. But uh, there just were not as many Spanish-speaking folks where I grew up. A lot of my friends and my brothers were fascinated with Asian languages, so I was around Japanese a lot more than I was around Spanish. And so my mom took a trip to Mexico and then she started trying to learn Spanish really rapidly. So the only things in our car were like Spanish uh, linguistic CDs and then the sounds of different tree frogs. She was trying to learn to identify frogs by sound. <laughs> my dad would get so mad because he'd, he'd get in the car and six CD changer and none of them would have any music. It'd all be super weird educational things. He's coming along pretty well. I'm just trying to add highlights where you're needed to really make things pop. I think I might have done that too much kind of around his eye in one spot, though. I'm probably going to find my pens here and fix that. She can't say, do I say it right? Paprika? <laughs> Um, I had a friend, she doesn't live here anymore, but she was in school here at University of Arizona when I first moved to Tucson 12 years ago, who had, uh, because of where her parents were from, she had a Welsh Cockney accent. And we were always trying to get her to say words like helicopter because she would say them so, I can't even mimic it. It was so weird. So if you were around her a lot, like I, I was, I had no problem understanding her. Like I learned how to kind of just easily attune to her accent, but a lot of people would just be like. You need to translate. We don't know what she's saying uh, because her accent was like just that thick. I only have an accent with a few words. Um, and yeah, I just went back in with black pen to kind of touch up the eye. You can always do that if something's not dark enough. You can always go back to your pen. Now I'm going to put the important part in the eye, the most important part, the highlight that brings everything to life. I say a uh, very few words with the accent um, that is most like the nanny. If you've seen the show, the nanny, Fran, the nanny. Uh, if there were words I mostly heard my relatives in New York say, I say a few words with like a Brooklyn or New Jersey accent. And it's a very few words because <laughs> for the most part, I don't have an accent. Like people, people out here don't really think that I do. So, I mean, I've, I haven't been back to the East Coast since I was 20 and I'm almost 40, so I've spent almost as much time on in the Midwest, Southwest, and West Coast as I did on the East Coast. But I can't remember what I was watching. I think maybe Daniel was watching something on YouTube with someone who couldn't say a word right and it was pretty funny. Sometimes he just shows me random videos, so I have no idea where they were or what they, where they came from. Um, I'm not always good at keeping up on memes and things. You'd think I would be because I do a lot online, but honestly, I'm so busy with projects and Patreon and Kickstarter and those things that um, I don't end up <laughs> reposting a lot of memes. I'll occasionally share a meme, but most of the time I end up unfollowing people if all they do is post memes. Like you... If you post like three or four memes a day, you probably will be unfollowed by me on Facebook. <laughs> or if you post really offensive memes. And I am not an easily offended person. So usually the ones that offend me are um, like if they're, if I feel like they're really ignorant, like someone just reshared it and didn't read anything about it. Didn't actually check if it was real. Or if the facts made sense and how they were presented, but felt the need to reshare whatever. Like if I'm going to, if I'm going to post something, if I'm going to share something that's 
news related or political or something, I'm probably going to at least put 10 seconds into verifying whether it has a basis or not. So many of the posts that people share, specifically on Facebook, um, where folks are outraged about something, if you actually look it up, you're like, that's just dumb. <laughs> like, my favorite one was the the woman who was thrown in jail for, I, I want to say six months to a year for um, faking which school district her child was in. And it's going to run as a meme a bunch of times. Um, people think it's so unfair. She just wanted her child to have a better education. So the thing about that is it takes about 20 seconds when that meme goes around to look up the news story and the actual facts of the case and the report. And nothing in the meme is not factually true, but they leave a lot out. So she did indeed go to jail for an extensive period of time. And it was for faking the school district her son was in. However, she agreed to take that as a plea deal because she did not fake it to get him a better education. She faked what school district he was in to have him sell drugs to the preppy kids at the nicer school. And she was also running a prostitution ring out of their apartment. <laughs> so rather than have a much heavier charge for those other things, she pled to get like a plea deal for like that as a lighter charge. So technically speaking, that's what the charge was. And she was jailed for that. But that was like, if you know the whole story, you're like, well, that's entirely different impression. I don't feel sorry for this lady at all. I don't feel like she was trying to be a better mom and get her kid into a nice school when you hear that. But if you take the facts out of context, it's super easy to get convinced because you don't have to lie. You just have to present a select number of facts in a certain way. Um, and I think there's a lot of that going around right now <laughs> in politics and in the news media with the virus because things that scare people are usually what people will click on, unfortunately. And it doesn't mean those facts aren't true. It just means that you're usually not getting the right context with them at all. <laughs> um, so I don't know. If I see a lot of shares like that from people who just like constantly repost like three or four things like that a day, I will just get frustrated and unfollow them. And if it's really offensive, I might unfriend them. But it usually takes a bit for you to even get to be friends with me on my personal Facebook. They have to have had a conversation with you. Because um, I've definitely had people who say, well, we're like big fans of yours and we own your art. Can we be on your personal Facebook? And I'm like, just because you own my art <laughs> doesn't mean you you know me personally. Because um, there's there's th things on Twitch, like I'll filter kind of what I say on Twitch to what I'm comfortable talking about. The same way I would... Uh, doing a panel at a convention or any of those things. So if um, if you're on my personal Facebook, then you're getting news about like my pets and my immediate kind of family and my boyfriend, my boyfriend's family. Like it's a lot more personal. So I don't, I have like a professional Facebook as well. So I don't tend to just friend tons of people on there. I try to have some kind of separation. And now that I'm Twitch streaming, I probably don't have that much separation uh, since a lot of the folks on my Twitch streams are people from all different parts of my life. But that's cool. I make it work. Most of the time it's fine. Occasionally people get really weird. I think I was talking about this in another stream where you always make sure if you're if you're working in an event, you always know where either the store manager is or if it's a convention, who the convention security is. And where they are just on the offhand that you or someone else either has a shoplifter or is being harassed by someone. I've almost never had an issue at a convention. I've been around other people who've had issues, though, and have to talk to security. Like, it has happened. Um, I've definitely had people make me feel uncomfortable at conventions to the point where if they hadn't left, I would have talked to security. And it, it was just a not respecting of personal boundaries. <laughs> Uh, usually it's not a problem because I usually have a, I'm behind a table, so there is a physical boundary there, but occasionally there'll be people who think it's fine to like run around a table while you're painting and hug you, even if they've only met you once before and 
you have a brush and wet paint and things going on. So I try to kind of make it harder to come around the table. So people have to actually ask me and I have to stop painting and choose if I'm going to hug someone. That's always good, right? <laughs> and of course, right now we're not doing any sorts of hugs or conventions. Our uh, summer one got bumped to November because that's kind of up to the hotels. And they were a little concerned that June might be too early for a convention. So they, even though we are starting to do a little bit of a reopen here in Tucson. So the only issue with it getting bumped to November is they, they were very good and did not pick a weekend that conflicted with our other conventions. But what that does mean is I now have three back-to-back -back convention weekends in November. Um, two of them I would be vending at, and then one of them I would be, well, actually two of them I'd be vending at, and then two of them I'd be guesting at. So there'd be like a, one I'm doing both at, uh, I think. Though I haven't heard any details about it yet because I think everything's on hold right now until we find out for sure if we're having conventions. And I used to do a lot of painting like this at conventions. Sometimes I can do, if it's not a really big or busy convention, I can do little paintings like this, but I can't do uh, really big ones because there's just not, there's just too busy. Sometimes there's not good lighting, but I have a solar powered battery that I can plug into my light that actually <laughs> fixes that issue. I'm hoping by November we will be back functioning. I'm hoping by September because my birthday is in September and I would like to, um, I have kind of a, a birthday convention plan thing that I would like to have to do. So we'll see. I want to kidnap some of my female friends and have a girls weekend, which I have actually never done in my entire life. So, um, I, I did not have a lot of female friends growing up. I usually go on with the boy is much better. Uh, it's kind of a tomboy. So now I know enough kind of tomboy girls or just girls I get along with a lot better. So I'm kind of hoping to, uh, to kidnap a few folks and Probably Daniel can't do it because he can never get Labor Day weekend off, which is what my birthday is. But my birthday is actually on Labor Day this year. So I will try to come back for my birthday dinner if he's not working. <laughs> but I am uh, I'm hoping I can do the weekend kind of for that. And maybe we'll do Sabo, which is an event I used to always vend at Sabaton. And it's just too much work to do a four-day vend when I have all this stuff going on online. So I was thinking I might do it as more of a guest and Twitch streamer and attendee for my birthday. I'm trying to convince a few other folks who have been Twitch streaming to go with me. So we'll see how that goes. So you might, you might get to see some cool content from us at a convention. And that's one of my favorite conventions, even though it's not really viable for me to vend there just because four days of sitting there <laughs> but um but i like it as an event it's our biggest anime con in the southwest and it's a really really good one i'm pretty sure it's our biggest one it was one of the biggest ones definitely the biggest one in arizona and new mexico and i think it's the best run one i am friends with the people who run it but i became friends with them after i started being at their conventions not the other way around so there's no favoritism there they just handle things well because if you've gone to anime cons or comic cons, either as an attendee, as a guest, um, as a volunteer, you know that stuff is going to go wrong. You're coordinating so many different types of things. You're coordinating a variety of guests flying in from different locations, autographs, concerts, vendors, artists, panels. So there's no way something isn't going to hiccup, sometimes multiple things. And what you want is a staff that knows how to handle things and how to minimize any issues. So the staff that runs Sabaton and Konnichiwa, Konnichiwa is the one that got bumped to November. And they also run one in Flagstaff and run one in Albuquerque. And I think they're working with some others now on some other shows. I don't know. But it's Monkey Paw. Monkey Paw does an awesome job. They kind of go above and beyond for their fans like when Phoenix kind of changed a lot of the 
parking meter things so that parking meters no longer free on weekends. That really impacted younger fans attending a show because paying for parking meters or just paying for parking in garages can get pricey. They uh, increased their ticket prices by just a little bit for the four-day tickets, but they then took the extra, like, $5 a person and rented a parking garage, and that's included. So if you go for the four-day pass, you get parking with it, which is, I think, just for peace of mind, awesome. And they were very proactive dealing with... um, They don't always tell us what conventions are going to be in a convention center with us, sometimes because they can't. So during our last presidential election, we ended up like very last minute finding out that um, the other half of the convention center here in Phoenix was going to be used for a Trump rally. And they had to, the convention staff had to kind of sit down with the Secret Service and get things figured out really, really quickly. And they did. They handled it really well. So, um, you know, they're kind of, they're kind of like, yeah, we're not really worried about the virus because we're used to just dealing with so much crazy stuff around conventions and we'll, we'll work with it. I'm sure it's difficult for them having to bump events because it changes the guests sometimes. And I hope they're going to be okay. (laughs) I know it's a lot. And I don't always agree with all their choices, but I totally respect them because they're having to deal with a lot of people and they can't make everyone happy. So I don't expect them to make me happy all the time or pick the decisions that'll work best for me. Um, But I respect the business that they run and how will they do it and keeping people informed. And if there are problems or things that go wrong, trying to fix them right away, which I think is so important. And coming from kind of LA before I lived in Tucson, I lived in LA and then I lived in Flagstaff and then I lived in Tucson. Um, A lot of the bigger California shows, they really don't care about the, the vendors or the fans in detail because they've been around for a really long time and people will always go and they just don't feel like they have to ever improve the experience because they won't make more money by doing that. They are already selling all their tickets. So why change? And That's a very sort of corporate point of view versus conventions that are run by fans for fans, people who want you to have a good time and be happy. So I've always tended to go more for the ones that are taking care of my fans who were there uh, and helping me get new ones and who are being kind to vendors and giving us good information. And if there's hiccups trying to improve things, for next year or do everything they can to make them to correct for the issues. So I just feel like I'd rather support those sorts of conventions than ones who say, Hey, if you don't want to write us a physical check in the mail, because we're never going to take online payments because we've been doing it this way since the (laughs) seventies, I've actually had this conversation. Uh, It's okay. We've got a waiting list for an artist table and somebody else will just take yours. And I said, that's fine. Somebody else can take mine that's your attitude. Like, that's just silly. That's not how you treat a customer or anyone else. (laughs) So yeah, I have to definitely cut back on like the, the LA California shows. And I don't really like going back to LA. I don't love the traffic. I think if I got invited as a guest, I could just like fly in and get chauffeured around (laughs) in taxis or, or whatever. It would be a different situation. Um, but I don't like the drive. It's about eight hours from Tucson to LA. And it's not a gr- very interesting or pleasant drive. The drive from Tucson to uh, like Albuquerque is only about six and a half hours. And it's very interesting. You get to do see a lot of cool scenery and a lot of interesting little towns and landmarks. But the one from here to LA is just not. <laughs> I don't miss that drive uh, at all. So it would take a lot of fans requesting it to get me back at those types of shows um just because I feel like it's not the best experience for some of my fans either they want to come see me and they can't even find me because events are big and the the numbers of the tables aren't handled well at some of these and they don't give you a good enough map and stuff like that you think you think with the technology now I mean they put the maps on your phone and everything but they're just not great at uh at those little details because they've kind of always done things the way they've always done things. And people go to those conventions because they have big fancy names and 
Well, that's fine. If you want to see the biggest guests and the biggest, um, you know, movie stars and things, I understand that. It's just, I don't need to be a guest at those. <laughs> um, I don't need to be a vendor at those if they're way more expensive and way more exhausting, but we don't necessarily make any more money and end up behind on online work for Patreon because they're too tiring. And yeah, I don't miss those. <laughs> I haven't even been doing Phoenix. Uh, I think it's Fan Fusion. That's what it's called. Now, I haven't done that the last couple of years. The last three or four years. Um, again, because people couldn't find me there. And I didn't feel right telling my fans to spend like 80 bucks on a ticket. Giving them a six-digit number to find my booth or table. That seemed pretty bad. So... <laughs> Uh, it just didn't, and then, and then, and then that, that was so crowded downtown in Phoenix that we couldn't like hang out with the other artists or writers or guests and have dinner or anything. Cause it was just be kind of miserable. So I would go back, um, uh, to do panels again, cause I like doing those, but only if I get asked as a guest. So tell people who want me at events, you got to tell the event because they'll look for how many people request someone in order to invite them to something. So, and that usually means I can cut around lines and I don't have to, um, buy space to do a signing. I can usually just do a signing somewhere as part of doing a panel, uh, which is a better experience for me. I don't have to invest a lot of money. I usually have to cover hotel unless it's, they want me as a really big guest there. That's only happened a couple times at events. Uh, but I usually have hotel points, so <laughs> that's not, not an issue. So. Yeah, if you want to see me at something, tell the event that you want me there. Because I would love to do, like, some of the other conventions in New Mexico, too. But again, that has to, like, be worth it for me to do that drive or flight. Which usually means enough people have to want me there. Because you don't want to, like, drive six hours and go to do a panel and have, like, two people on the panel. That doesn't work well. Especially when you can do Twitch streaming and reach people everywhere anyway. Okay, I think our cheeky guy is just about done. I'm trying to think if he needs anything else. I think I might put some uh, some more sparkles kind of in the background here. I kind of want this to look kind of magical and glowy, so I might add some more magical sparkles. My white ink. A few more highlights on his hand wouldn't hurt either. Pretty close. Now. I'm super procrastinating doing things like folding laundry and putting sheets on the bed and mailing Kickstarter rewards that I should go do. Sparkle, sparkle, sparkle. A little highlight there. He has another wing back here. It's just, I painted it in pretty dark because it's kind of in shadows. So just making sure it stands out at least a little bit. All the sparkles. Seems pretty good. I've never done South by Southwest. I don't know that one. Um, I mean, I think I've heard of it, but I've never been. Never been asked. I've done San Diego Comic Con plenty. You probably couldn't pay me enough to get me back there. Uh, it is San Diego Comic Con's the one that a lot of us as guests and vendors joke is the one everybody wants to do because they've never done it. And after you've done SweatCon once, you don't need to do it again. Which you'd think that San Diego would not be as uncomfortable as say like a convention in Phoenix. But the thing about the Phoenix Hotels and Convention Centers is it's so hot, everything has to be inside. Whereas in San Diego that kind of so outgrown that space that you just end up with crazy long lines in the sun and it's humid and it's July and you get sunburned and yeah, it's just so big. It's not really worth it. I've had friends go to do it and be like, I did one day and I left. Um, I have never done it and not gotten sick, uh, which is, which is bad. Like I've gotten sick every time. I think I did it three years in a row. I got sick after every show and I wasn't even vending there. Um, I was there uh, as part of some of the Dark Crystal stuff with Tokyo Pop we were doing, and um, 
as an attendee and then I was there as like a professional on some of the for some of the panels and stuff but it's just it's just not I don't think it's a good experience I mean you might have one starstruck cool moment but you're never really going to get to talk to anybody famous they have too many bodyguards it's too busy so I think the mid-sized ones are um are better I mean the one that is now Phoenix Fan Fusion that used to be Phoenix Comic Con, that used to be one of my favorite ones. It was an amazing show. And then I think they didn't really know how to grow with, to grow in the right way with the increase in size. And it created a lot of problems for guests, for vendors, uh, for people who wanted to find us. And it just stopped being worth it for me to be there. Uh, unless I get asked as a guest. Like I said, if I get asked as a guest again, I used to do panels there occasionally. I wouldn't mind doing that um, because I can just go up and do a panel and go back to my hotel room. But when you're vending, you've got to sit there for, you know, like a guest, you can go do a signing and that's it. You're good. When you're vending, you've got to kind of staff um, a table for four days. And sometimes it's as long as nine or 10 hours a day. And I just don't have that energy. I mean, look at how much art and how busy I am when we're in quarantine at home and tri- picture me trying to keep up on that. So I come back from a conventional exhausted and have to get into that. So if you go back like six years ago, I used to do maybe 14, 15 conventions, uh, not to mention other events. I would travel to Texas. I traveled to New Mexico. And I just don't do that as much anymore because uh, one of the reasons is we have Bookman's here in Tucson. And now that I've become a little bit of not really well known, but enough of an established local author they host a lot of like short two to four hour events and book releases and things for us where they don't charge us anything to be there. And we get to sell our books and we get to see our fans and it's one afternoon. So even if I don't make very much money, I may make 50 or a hundred bucks, but I'm not spending $300 on a table in like a week of my time to do the prep and be there for four days and all that. So it ends up being just as good financially and much more bearable physically uh, the only really, really big one I do is um, Tucson Festival of Books, which is on par with San Diego Comic-Con and Phoenix Fan Fest uh, for size. It's actually like upwards of 140,000, 150,000 people now, which is crazy uh, for it being a two-day event instead of a four-day event. It's completely insane. So I was really bummed when that got canceled because I can handle that because it's two days. If it was over that, that'd be too much. So I'm trying to decide if I should go get my other stuff done. It's probably a good stopping point that we do have a lot of other fun pieces to work on here. I'm trying to decide on this guy what color I want my sophisticated Drake to be, too. He might actually end up being white, as weird as that sounds. I mean, I won't leave him white, white, but like a beige color. I don't do that many light colored dragons, and I think if he's sophisticated, that might be be cool to either make him white or maybe make him more of a black dragon. I don't know. I'll have to think on that one. But yeah, I've got at least getting some of these knocked out. And then these are the ones, since I know you're one of our, our monthly subscribers, these are the ones that are going to get mailed out uh, in this size because these are the smaller ones. So though Daniel might make me keep this one and do another one since I kind of put his drink in it. We'll see. <laughs> he has made me keep so much stuff we haven't even hung up yet, though. We have to hang up our... Um, our zombie squirrel that I saved from Spirit Dragon sometime, uh, which is the book I think I was working on when he and I first started dating. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you got to realize that, okay, so Gen Con and San Diego Comic Con, when they say they have 150 or 175K in attendance, and Phoenix Fan Fusion says they have, like, I think at their peak, it was 70 to 80K in attendance. Phoenix Fan Fusion is actually bigger. And here's the reason why. If you can find them. Oh, you can't. I don't know. I, I think I think because you got the one everybody wanted the last time. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'll see where things go out to. You might you might end up with this one. We'll see. Uh, since you said you liked it. Uh, we have to. I, I think he might end up being on uh, on some of the swag this month, too. If I can figure out a way to do a cool sticker, I think he'd be a cool sticker. Uh, but yeah, what happens is um, there's two ways, at least two that I know of, of counting attendance to an event. So one is to count the number of tickets sold. And the other is to count by fire marshal code, which is basically um, every person through the door. 
So San Diego Comic Con, Gen Con, and many of the other big like Wizard World, they count uh, using um, fire marshal code, which means that if you buy a three day pass and you go for three days or a four day pass, you go for four days, you're counted for each day. So you get um, counted four times. Versus if you are looking at like the way Phoenix Fan Fusion used to do their numbers when they said they had 70k, they were talking about ticket sales plus staff and guests. So whether it's a one day ticket or a three day ticket, you were only counted once. So <laughs> it actually ends up being. And then if you look at the fact that I mean, I assume with Festival of Books, they're just because they aren't even selling tickets, they're counting. Uh, they have counters out there by the entrance. They're counting for like the per day for the two days. So they're counting more like Gen Con or San Diego Comic Con would be, but the fact that they're getting numbers almost as high and it's a two day event is meaning it's a lot of people and it's a free event. So it's kind of crazy. So um, some of the shows are like comparatively speaking, they say we're bigger and I don't know why they think saying bigger is better. It's really not. Uh, I used to love anime expo in LA when I was 19, I started going and it was 20,000 people. I think I stopped going when it passed 60,000 people and then it moved downtown and it was terrible. <laughs> uh, downtown is not, LA is not a good place for a fan based convention. It was great when it was in Anaheim because you had Disneyland hotels and restaurants and things to kind of accommodate fans and their families. But yeah, I mean, there's different things too, whether you're attending or, or vending at something. And of course, what you like at a convention is going to vary. Like we have a convention here, uh, Tuscon, which I love. It is probably one of my favorite two or three things I do every year. And people either love it or they don't like it at all because there isn't a lot of cosplay. It's only 500 people or less. So it's a very different type of show. But if you want to go talk to Jim Butcher, who wrote the Dresden Files, or um, the writer of like a new series, like that's where you're going to get to do that without bodyguards, you know. Um, if you want to ask George R. R. Martin a question and he's their guest of honor, you're going to get to actually ask him your question because there's only going to be like 50 or a hundred people in the room with you versus three or 4,000 people. So that's my favorite one because you get to talk right to the creators. And also because, um, and I don't know if you ever checked out my stream, but shout out to Joe who does this. He's awesome. He's on my Facebook Joe, who plans their panels, he kind of makes it his job never to really do the same panel twice. So all the panels are way more creative. And if you are a writer who guests at conventions uh, and you have a certain niche that they put you in, um, I think my friend Jenny told me that she and April Lynn have been on the same YA urban fantasy that uses fairies panel at like 12 conventions in one year. Like it was terrible. Um, and it's just not that interesting. Whereas, uh, Tuscon, they will just pick like the weirdest thing. I got to do a really awesome panel with an award-winning poet on, um, subliminal and subconscious creativity and subconscious writing, like how you process things in your sleep and then how you wake up and document them or like how some people get ideas in the shower, stuff like that. So it's like really fascinating talking about how you let ideas sort of like marinate in your brain and then and then suddenly have like a finished thing when it comes out like you know exactly what it's going to look like uh so it was really cool that was an awesome panel um when we were doing that panel I was really bummed because I had to get to it like a little early when you're a panelist you have to do that so I had to run out of the last 15 minutes of a panel some friends of mine were on they were doing one on um kind of ghosts and I can't remember what it was called, but it was like kind of ghosts and supernatural in the Southwest. And it was a big panel. They had like eight creators on it. And what was so awesome is they put uh, folks on it who were believers and folks on it who were skeptics and they let them argue, which was like it was one of the most fun panels. Uh, Cause they, it was getting very heated by the time I left it. I was like, darn it. I was watching my friends about to have a fist fight. This was going to be awesome. But that's like the convention where like, if you're at, even like a show in Phoenix or in San Diego, they're too big to do a lot. There's too much networking. Whereas Tuscan, you can actually just go hang out at the bar and have drinks with some really famous writers and have a normal conversation with them, which is super cool. Um, and it's something that has been around us. I think this is their 37th year, I want to say. It's been around a very long time. 
So I've always been super honored to be a part of it. Um, I've been doing it for, I want to say like 10 years. Um, so yeah, if you, th some people love it, some people don't because what they're looking for is different. If you want a big Comic-Con with tons of amazing over the top cosplays, then you're better going to either San Diego or honestly, my number one convention recommendation, if you want a Comic-Con right now is Tucson Comic-Con. Uh, last year they had the best costumes I've ever seen at a convention. And I don't mean they were the highest budget. Because you see a lot of people do really expensive, accurate costumes. I mean, they were the most creative costumes. I saw people doing costumes I have never seen before, which is super rare. You might see one of those a year at some convention. You wouldn't see 10 of them in a day. Um, there was somebody who did Fievel from Fievel Goes West with a cactus. Yes, there was a person cosplaying a cactus. It was amazing. A cartoon cactus, not, not just any cactus. Um, there was Empire Records cosplay, which is one of my favorite movies from the 90s and is not something you would ever expect to see. Uh, there were probably the most believable Indiana Jones and his dad I've ever seen. Like there was just like the biggest variety of costumes from all walks of media that I think I've seen at a convention in years. And the weird thing was the year before there, we didn't really see that. It was like everybody stepped it up last year. So I'm hoping I'm going to get to go this year. I was a guest last year. They've kind of been not really announcing anything about cheese on Comic Con this year. I think it's they're all waiting to make sure the uh, stay at home order is going to get lifted, uh, which um, it's usually like November. It's actually back to back weekends with Tuscon. So I usually get to do two in a row. And then I move to Kanichiwa down there. I get to do three in a row in November. So that's going to be a fun marathon of convention crazies. Uh, but since I know Twitch stream, I will try to maybe either stream from the conventions if I can, or at least post lens pics on Patreon or do something. <laughs> so you guys can kind of see a bit more of what I do at conventions. I don't know if somebody can, uh, sometimes they do record and post our panels too. I don't know. Some of the conventions do that. Some do not. So anyway, now that I've talked off the ear of the few people watching, <laughs> I am going to go be good and fold my laundry and put sheets on the bed and what were the other things I had to do? <laughs> um, do shipping and all that fun stuff. So thank you guys for hanging out with me this afternoon or whatever time it is where you are. Um, I think I'll probably see at least some of you at the assorted different DJ things that are going on. Tonight we have Mojito DJing and then tomorrow I think we have, oh gosh. I know Plastic Disease and Noir Tech, and I feel like somebody else is also DJing, but I'm forgetting someone. So, till then, stay safe, wash your hands. I will try to figure around and do more streaming. I don't know if I'm going to get to it this weekend because everyone else is streaming. I might. Otherwise, I will be uh, back early next week streaming, and you can always find me on my website, raredragons.com, on Discord, um, all that fun stuff. Drop me a line. I'm going to be doing commissions. Uh, live on the stream pretty soon as well. We have a bunch of those that I just got deposits on. We have concepts approved on at least two. So you could stay tuned for that awesome stuff soon. And for more of these guys, be safe, be positive, be creative, and remember to wash your hands and not go crazy.